Welcome to another Homeboys Extra. As you'll hear, I'll warn you all now, they will be background noise as they are every week. Now, a wee bit different this week. What I've got sitting in front of me is, I believe, is one of the Scotland's great paradoxes, as, as you'll find out as we go into the actual in-depth of the interview. But first of all, I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Ian McGill. Ian, how are you? Very well, Paul. Very, very, very well. Very well. Looking resplendent in his uh, design of stubble. Close crop here, you know, it's a new generation. But before we get into it, Ian... I think our listeners would be very uh, keen to know what it's like to be on Chris Graham's enemies list. Best thing ever. My, I've only got one ambition in life, is to get to number one in Chris Graham's enemies list. <laughs> and not even, I'd, he's got me a lot of friends. I didn't have so many Celtic friends, I didn't have so many <laughs> Aberdeen friends until Chris Graham put me at the top of that list. I've had fights from folks, Aberdeen, Celtic, Dundee United, total strangers going, you're that Ian McGill, Chris Graham hates you, have a pint. And do you know why you're on it? Okay. I think it's a bit of a measure of the man's grasp of the political scene. Right. You know, I'm a Hearts fan. I'm a Hearts fan. I'm not a Rangers fan. I'm no Celtic fan either. I took great pleasure in great pleasure in Rangers demise from that as a Hearts fans. Uh, yeah, as Hearts fans did. I don't think Scotland needs a strong Rangers. Chris Graham took offence to that. Found a picture of me shaking hands with David Cameron. Decided decided me and David Cameron were best pals, best buddies, out in the boot all the time. Uh, yeah, and I've met Cameron a couple of times. But we're no best but this buddies. Is, I mean, this uh, kind of falls, in, uh, falls into the rampant paranoia that goes on. Absolutely. With this kind of thing. And, um, you know, obviously you were somebody who was quite vocal in that respect. And I think probably because they did see that you had probably a smidge of political mouse, yeah. that somehow you'd be using that to, to make sure Rangers died, basically. Yeah. Which yeah. is just ludicrous when you actually look at the yeah. story. They were, ca- they were capable of killing them. They were very capable of killing themselves yeah, on their own. Exactly, and, exactly. Uh, yeah, a bit, of, a, bit, a bit of gentle ribbing on Twitter in some way. It's, uh, you know, destroy my career and destroy my business. And, uh, Aye, I mean, this, I mean, this is, we'll come on to that later, yeah, actually, yeah. with social media and stuff. But first of all, what we talk about is the Homeless World Cup, which is something that we are flag bearer for for a long time. You've been a referee uh, and stuff like that. Can you tell me how you got involved in that? Yeah, the um, Homeless World Cup's just a fantastic project. I... Run from here in run from here in Edinburgh, working with projects in pretty much 100 countries around the world. Yep. Using football, using football as a hook, a tool for positive change with individuals, but also, but also presenting homeless folk in a real positive light. It's funny, rough sleeping's on the increase in Edinburgh at the moment, yeah. uh, and folks see folks begging, folks sleeping out in the streets. Say, uh, Read the odd, read the odd nasty story. Uh, folks don't have a positive impression of homeless folks. Yeah, yeah. And then you hold an event like the Homeless World Cup in Princess Street Gardens, and all these folk who cross the road to avoid a homeless person, they're coming down, supporting homeless folks, seeing homeless folk having fun, playing football. They've got skills. They can be entertaining. They've got personalities, and they're really changing their lives and moving on. So it's also flagging up. Homeless folk have got tons to offer and they just need an opportunity. Yeah. And that cities can't and shouldn't be, it's not out of sight, out of mind. There's mm-hmm. homeless folk here in Edinburgh that need our help and part of that, having it in Edinburgh, is raising that awareness. When I mean, we've had it around the world, Cape Town, Mel- Cape Town Melbourne, Copenhagen, yeah. it's raising the profile of, look, we got a homelessness problem in the city, what are we going to do about it? So folks come down, watch some football and go, but they also come away going, what are we going to do to get these folks off the streets? What are we going to do uh, about our homeless pro- about the homeless problems they have? I got involved in 2005 when Edinburgh hosted it. Yeah. They, uh, yeah, Mel Young founded a big issue in Scotland, runs a homeless World Cup. He phoned me up and said, Ian, I hear you got a background in homelessness international, uh, international aid and development and you have a referees badge. Oh yeah, this sounds like this sounds like uh, yeah, sounds, storm, really. sounds like something's coming. Uh, he said, "Yeah, we well, come down. We come down. We need some referees to volunteer." 
this is our right. this is idea, this is what we're doing. Can you come down and spare a week? I said, Yeah, of course, no problem. Now, can you bring three pals? <laughs> right, okay. So went down, refereed for a week. It was the best referee and I'd done. It was just great fun. There was a great buzz about the tournament. Folks were doing good things. And I was working in the homeless scene at the time. And I've just been involved ever since. Again, that sort of perfect storm. Uh, again, that perfect storm they're going... Oh, Ian, can you just help us out with this? Can you just help us out with that? And some of it is, Ian, will you drive will you drive four hours to do a presentation to a Rotary Club on a Thursday night and <laughs> wherever? And you're going, yes, I'll drive and do this presentation to the Rotary Club to try and get some funding. Uh, and other times it's, Ian, you're coming out to Cape Town with tournaments in Cape Town. Love you to be part of that. And uh, that's much more... Uh, probably much more fun than uh, doing a rotary club in the uh, middle of nowhere. Uh, but, uh, I'm, I'm sure, like, obviously, I mean, the exposure in terms of highly and uh, homeless people, but I'm sure it, in terms of people who are involved in a playing and, and managing and all that kind of it increases their self-worth, self-esteem. Uh, uh, absolutely. And that's time a time when they probably feel most alienated. Yeah. And football, and football's entirely, entirely just the hook to get, to get folks in and work with them. So... Football, football in itself, when it's done right in a nice, positive, healthy environment, does it increases folks' well-being, increases folks' fitness, increases uh, their self-respect, their esteem, yeah. all of that. Uh, just some basics. If exercise as a cure or an aid for mental health would be the biggest wonder drug in the world if someone just invented it now. Yeah, it'd be the yeah. biggest wonder drug in the world. It's not just and, been invented. Do you get it's like, um, how much support do you get, for example, for the SFA? Uh, it's come and gone over the last 11 years. So it it's, it's come and gone. It's come and gone. It's pretty good tonight. Uh, it's pretty good, but there's been... Pers- as personnel changes and both as personnel changes in different sides of organisations, funding streams and priorities change over the last eleven years or so. Uh, so yeah, there's And how does it how is it all funded? Is, are you relying on donations or do the companies get involved? Yeah. So it is so um the organize the turn the tournament and support for local organisations is a uh, Big, it's big sponsorship and small, big and small sponsorship. Yeah. Uh, we've had good deals over the years. Folks like Vodafone and Nike have given great funding and access to their access to their high-profile celebrities. Lewis Hamilton's and the likes coming down to do coming down to do stuff yeah. uh, and just absolutely small stuff like I'm saying, rotary clubs and schools doing fundraising, school classes doing projects to raise a hundred pounds or whatever. Yeah. Nike giving quarter of a million. Different. All scales. Uh, all scales doing well. Marketing, selling books and t-shirts, that yeah. sort of stuff. And uh, the cities that host. Cities compete to host the Homeless World Cup, and the city themselves, uh, city themselves, part of their hosting bid is a. Uh, it's, it's not cheap to run a tournament, yeah. bringing a few hundred people, bringing a few hundred people over, and they have to commit to a legacy. So they have to commit to. They have to commit to situation for homeless folk being better after the tournament than it was before the tournament so that legacy is all uh, that legacy is there and it costs money and that comes from that comes from the cities who want to use who want to use the homeless world club as a profile for their homeless population their homeless projects what they're doing uh, so they use that as a catalyst Mm -hmm. Uh, individual countries so in Scotland are partner street soccer Scotland David Duke would be a suggest David Duke for your podcast he'd be great fun or uh, or Ali Dawson who works there as well who obviously Ali played. Dawson has been mentioned on one of the podcasts previously actually right. he's managed to be Hamilton but we'll move for that so, so uh, Ali and Dave they work at an office just down, down the road in Leith there yeah. uh, so the Street Soccer Scotland they run the projects all year round with uh, with homeless folks up and down the country and 
they've got good partnership. So RBS are, RBS are the biggest funder at the moment. Uh, they've got a super par- super partnership going on with them. There's been different ones, uh, different ones through the years. Yeah. But it, RBS are a big partner at the moment and fund the local. Fund and the I local. guess mentioned that probably all football fans will be asking themselves when most of this is how have Scotland done in the world of football? Yeah. <coughs> It is, it's funny because there's been 13, so been 13 tournaments mm-hmm. and Scotland have won twice. Uh, Scot- right. Scotland's won twice out of 13. Really, really, res- really, really respect. Well, that's a men's tournament. We've not won the women's tournament yet and yeah. uh, we'll get there. There's a real... Uh, the press love it when they, the press love it when these guys win. That's a yeah. Real good news. It's a real good news story when these guys win. But we've got a real, a real affection for a lot of the teams who've no, a lot of the teams who've known on it. A uh, 60, 70 teams coming out. There's one team wins it, but everyone's. This is more, so much more than winning. Uh, teams. Teams at the top level, they talk. Uh, they talk about different things. You know, parts we're about being a good community club now. We're about developing young players and being a real positive, a real positive thing uh, in the community. We announced the new stand yesterday at the AGM, and it's about being great for the whole area and making sure Corgi gets revitalised through what we're doing. You know, it's so much more than so much more than just winning. But the winning's important. Homeless World Cup and the teams so much more than winning. It's such a bonus if you win. It was lovely to win the league last year, uh, but we're doing so much more. The Homeless World Cup team, lovely to win that trophy, but it's so much more. And there's plenty of guys who've been losing. Their stories are. Well, I can imagine, but what I would be interested in is I mean, would it be, for example, Scotland and England be as feisty as a normal Scotland and England team? When you cross, when you cross the line, when you cross, when you cross that line, and you, put on your, you cross that line, you put on the national anthem. It doesn't matter. You can pick yeah. anyone for Scotland, anyone for England. The difference, the difference is before, the difference is before and after. One of the real, one of the real interesting things of the Homeless World Cup is the players, the teams, everyone. Everyone's encouraged very much, encouraged and are forced to be mixing with other teams. So you have conversations, you have a Scottish guy sitting down sitting down with the team from Zimbabwe or Afghanistan, yeah. Israel, Palestine, Kenya. So yeah, what's it what's it like being homeless in Zimbabwe? <laughs> they say and they and they say and they go, ah, oh, they go, what's it like being homeless in Scotland? They tell Massive, con- massive, con- massive contrast. But folks are sharing their experiences. Very different. Uh, folks have been, folks have been refugees. Folks have been. Uh, there is teams coming out of refugee camps. There's teams coming out of just all sorts of experiences. So they form a bond. And the Scot- Scotland and England guys, they always form. They always form a bond. They've got a common language, a common cul- a common yeah. language, a common culture. They're going to be club pals, but they know the other. They know the folks from all the countries. They've got an idea of what's going on. Mm-hmm. The folks have got distinct, yeah, distinct personalities. Uh, teams for the favelas in Brazil. Yeah. They, yeah, they're pretty like you. They're pretty like you would imagine. Japan yeah. always bring a bunch of older guys. The Japanese team is. It's always a bunch of older, uh, yeah. older guys reflecting where they're cult- reflecting where their cultures are. You can see, and our homeless guys, you've got. There's ideas about them. There's often a, often a, often an ex-professional or two in our team. Mm-hmm. And when, it, when I say ex-professional, a, I mean guys who got released at 18, 19 and you know, so they had two, three, two, three years where two, three years where a good club there or there about didn't they make it uh, didn't they make it took some bad choices or took some bad choices and that meant they didn't make it it comes either way uh, the same in, same in, lo- same in lots of other teams uh, so quality is 
quality of football is good. Yeah. It's not the thing we it's not the thing we select on, we select on who's engaging with the we select on who's engaging with the programme. Right. Who's turning it who's turning up, who's doing the literacy classes, who's dealing with their addiction issues, who's dealing yeah. with their housing, who's dealing with their family uh, situations, and just who's grasping all the opportunities that we're giving. Folks are very much pushed to get qualifications, often, often in football. Uh, so the team selected on who's engaging. Yeah. But it's a football tournament. You want to win. Guys can play fit. The guys, guys who are loving the football engaging in the programme tend to be guys who can play a bit. Yeah. Do you know yeah. we got handy... Uh, you talked about the opportunities here. That's something I was interested in because obviously you mentioned at the start that yeah, you're playing football and all that kind of thing, but it's kind of like a vehicle for so other, so many other things. What are the other things that are being offered? Because clearly, being homeless isn't just about not being able to get a house. It's yeah. about the issues that surround yourself and yeah. things like that. So what kind of things are happening around the field? Yeah, so there's a... So a lot of this, a lot of this stuff, a lot of stuff going on. Housing, housing's part of it, but it's only, it's only part of it. Building it. Having enough houses is great, but it doesn't solve uh, it doesn't solve homelessness. Uh, it does for a little bit, but yeah. so much more, so much more complex stuff going on. So it is. We're working with folks, so addictions. So certainly help folks with housing. There's projects and support around addictions. There's projects and support around. Thank you, boss. Do you want a new No. Sorry, we just got breakfast served there. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, the folks love the background stuff. The folks love the background stuff. Here we go. Uh, so yeah, stuff, stuff around housing, stuff around addictions, stuff mm-hmm. around employability. So it's really, it is, it's really big on a, uh, really big on college courses, on training, uh, and getting your football coaching badges, and getting your refereeing badge, and getting, yeah, getting that stuff. Working around family breakdown, working around, working around family breakdown, working around mediation, and just working around the whole stuff. The whole stuff you spoke about at the start, uh, self-esteem, self-esteem, respect. Uh, so there's, so there's ton, tons going on. There's a complete program going on. There's partnership with Sam H. So the mental health stuff. Yeah. It's all. It is. It's a pretty complete, pretty holistic package there, which takes a lot of takes a lot of effort. But that's what gets. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's touched on the, the mental health aspect and that's exactly what I was going to come on to that so much homelessness is linked to mental health problems yes. but as you know mental health problems are, are mostly unseen yep so I mean I guess one of the things I'll try to say is probably you've taken on the role of the, the Homeless World Cup is to try and um, to destroy the stigmas around that if you like yeah and it, and it very and it very very much is a put I can't understate, I can't overstate the the partnership the Sam H the Scottish Association for Mental Health uh, and the work the work they're doing together, uh, and it fit, and it fits it fits in very well. So Sam mm-hmm. Sam H have got different arms to uh, different arms to what they do. Mm-hmm. Some of that is challenging the stigmas and whether that's you see, you see the posters it. Uh, seen a poster in the pub toilet or uh, encouraging, yeah, folk, yeah. encouraging folks to talk about it, encouraging folks to acknowledge mm-hmm. or whether it's encouraging folks to get active. You see they get active stuff, uh, get active stuff all the time because it's such a help and it's such a yeah. it's such a boost to anyone, such a boost to anyone's mental health to be outside, to be active, to be doing it. Uh, so it is. It's a good. It's a good mix. It's a good fit. It's a good partnership. Uh, if we can, we do provide that activity and a nice, holistic support. Yeah, because I mean, people certainly in, in my area, and I've seen things in the past. The people that didn't understand it, it's, a, it's almost like a vicious circle. We find poverty and, and, and mental health issues and depression and so on. That it's easy to get stuck on that many go around. Yeah, and you need somebody to pull you off it. And, and that's what the food. And that's what the football does. And that's what the football does. And the opportunities that we, uh, and the opportunities that come with us, football. The folks are on that. The folks are on that merry go round. They go. I don't know. Have a shot of that. And they right. step. They step. They right. step right. off because they go. I used to like football. I mind that. I mean, they mind going for a game of football with my right. pals. Or 
I saw the guys in the paper in Paris. They were yeah. not, I used to play, but I could do that. I want to go there. I want to. I want to be winning the most World Cup in Paris. That looks like something I could do, eh? And they step off, they step off that roundabout, down to, down to our session. And yeah, some of them go, no, oh, I wouldn't mind doing my coaching badge here. I could volunteer with these guys. Yeah, off to college. There we go. Yeah, actually, I am seeing my, I am seeing my addictions working. I am seeing my 12 steps I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, some of them go, I'm a long way from where I was two years ago. Aye. It's like they turn around on Sunday. Aye. Yeah, just that little, that little change in perspective. Suddenly, suddenly Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond want to meet them and get a photo with them. <laughs> what? What's the first minister coming down for a kickabout with? Suddenly, Alex Ferguson's coming along and getting them a wee bit of coaching. Aye. Hold on, why is Alex Ferguson giving me a wee bit of coaching? I'm just that. Aye. I'm just a wee boy of the scheme here, and suddenly everyone's wanting a piece of me. What? That is, I, mean, I think that's a really good point because I've been affected by it myself where when you come to certain areas and stuff you do feel a bit like anything good that happens to you shouldn't really happen to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you feel it's your party, like, you know. And I don't know if it's a big Scottish thing or not, but I, it's certainly something we see, folks. Why would they want to talk to Exactly. Mm. Right. These are the guys... These are the folks who should be talking to and need to be talking to and, and genuinely want to, you know. They're up. They get paraded out at half time in Scotland games. They take the trophy round, they take the trophy round ground so they're at Motherwell at half time and Hibs at half time. They're up to City Chambers showing off the trophy. They're doing the Butte House meeting First Ministers yeah. and all and something like that. <laughs> Them. Such another world, such another yeah. worldly experience. But we do, Scots, sit there and just a wee laddie for leaf, why this? Aye, exactly. No, I think you're, you're absolutely right. So, I mentioned at the start that there's a bit of a paradox coming. The paradox is you've probably spoken there, and probably people who don't know you didn't realise what your politics are and what your political history is, which is obviously standing for the Conservative Party, primarily in Leith, which. Um, I guess it's, it's kind of the equivalent of standing for Sinn Féin and Shankill Road. Oh, I mean, when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, how, did, how, how, how does what you just said fit in the, your actual politics? Fits in. Fits in well. When I was... Uh, My favourite political poster. Lots of, my favourite political poster was a was a was one of John Major. Mm-hmm. And John Major was prime minister. It's a black and white one. He was a grey man. He wasn't a particularly he wasn't a handsome man like you and me, Paul. <laughs> hey, poster to him. What's the Conservative Party, black and white, and underneath big letters, what's the Conservative Party offer a working class boy for Brixton? They made him Prime Minister. For me, they were always, always the party, uh, and they still are the party that says it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter what you've done, work hard, you can be anything. Work hard, you can be anything. And that fits right in with the Homeless World Cup as well. So it doesn't matter where you are right now. It doesn't matter what you've done. And plenty of the guys on the streets are in a good place right now. And plenty of folks on the streets have done things they're no particularly proud of and they think will follow them around forever. So it doesn't matter about that. Where you are now, let's give you an opportunity. Let's get that ladder in place there so we can give you a hand up. It's not about a handout. The you know, Homeless World Cup's no about a handout. It's no, oh, oh, poor you, your homeless will take you off to play some football. Yeah. It's no that at all. It's you've got a ton of potential. There you are, you're on the streets, you've got a ton of potential. We see it, and we're going to give you the hand to see that potential through. And we're going to give you that hand to go and do great things. And that runs through my politics, and it runs through the Homeless World Cup, and it runs through things like the... Things like the big issue, you know, the big issue, their big motto. It's a hand up, it's no a hand out. Mm-hmm. So, you talked about opportunities and giving a hand up. How do you tell people who live perhaps in Nidri or Nugus, who are facing welfare cuts like we've never seen since the Great War, who are facing 
uh, tax credit cuts, we're facing, you know, but some things 15, 60 percent poverty in their areas and unemployment. Where does that fit in with the Conservative Party line on we're here to help everybody? But we are. It's uh, we are moving. We're moving very much to confirm as society where folks there's an expectation that folks do work, that folks do go out, folks do work hard, folks do sitting around getting a hand out is an option. So it's putting the opportunities in place there so folks can get off that get off that circle of being written off and that doesn't matter if you're a uh, and that doesn't matter particularly whoever you are as a society we were writing folks off there you go you'll be on that you'll be on that benefit for life but no going to try and make it folks have got it folks have got some of the disability stuff hey it's very much part there you go you'll never work have some benefits for life tons to contribute tons to offer as a society we're writing them off and to me I never sat like that. And it didn't. So it's getting the getting the stuff in now. Unemployment grows ever, jobs are growing, jobs are growing, there's a wide variety of jobs out there. There's tons of support to get people into the work. And it is. And society's gonna be society's gonna be better for that. Just for, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, the hand up stuff's there. So saying all that, how come nobody in Scotland was listening to you? Because clearly they're not voting for you. Well, there's a couple of You've just written off 400,000 folks, so there's 400,000 folks well, voting Tories. Well, to be fair, they probably write me off as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, but... 400,000 400, folks isn't nobody. Fair enough. And that's... Uh, so, peop- so people do, but there's a... Uh, we've, we've not been great at making our argument over the years. We went... We left the field a little, and uh, they're on up to '97, and then '97 when we yeah. got when we got when we got wiped out. I was working in the round the corner of the Royal Mail, and so I'm doing a night shift in Brunswick Road. It's going to be yeah. nice flats now, but it, it's yeah. doing, a, doing a night shift sorting the mail. The results were coming through, and uh, they were ripping me mercilessly. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we, abandoned, we abandoned the field there. We didn't stick up for ourselves. We didn't articulate what was going on. There's uh, so many myth, so many myths that have built up. Yeah, we let folks build up. Labour closed more mines in Scotland than the Tories did. <laughs> you didn't hear that talk. You didn't yeah. hear that talked about. And we let that. Uh, we let that run. Where we're at now, politics is changing in Scotland. It has changed very much with things like things like the referendum. Yeah. And what you've seen is what you've seen is Labour and the Lib Dems have left the field. Yeah. They're not. They come out saying, "Oh, we'll let our guys have a free vote. We can do whatever. Yeah. We can do whatever we want on the union there because there's because there's a division there. They're not willing to go out and they're unwilling to work defend what they've done in the Better Together campaign. Mm-hmm. And that leaves it wide open for us because we're very proud of keeping the country together. We're yeah. very proud saying what we've done is absolutely right. It's a great thing. We've kept the country together. We'll do it again. Keep the country together. And we're the safest." pair of hands there folks and parties that leave the field and folk, parties that abandon their line in the, in the face of siphon that abuse on Twitter or yeah. or just the perception that oh on my street there's three of the cars have got a yes Scotland sticker on and the other 17 cars have got nothing on it must be a yes street yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not they've just got three uh, yeah I mean you know, I, I would definitely um, agree with you that there was definitely flaws in the Yes campaign. But first, before we get into that, what I want to ask you is 55% of this country voted for the main party in the yeah. just over a year ago. Do you think that figure would be the same if there was a referendum today? I think it would be higher. Really? Yeah, I think it would be higher. There's no, there's no appetite. So, two things. One, uh, There were some people who felt safe to vote yes because it would never happen, mm-hmm. but they wanted to give two fingers up to Cameron and Clegg. Yeah. 
and the effect, and they did, it was a very effective two fingers to Cameron and Clegg there. Uh, so some people felt safe to do it because they thought it would never happen, and they got a fight because it was closer than, uh, closer than they expected. The second is, you kind of keep having referendums every year on the same question. Yeah. Uh, folks know that, but they had another so, if they had another so quickly, if they had another so quickly, so going to vote no in a bigger number to put it to bed because they want it put, they want it put to bed if Sturgeon thought she could win it she would call it yeah if Sturgeon thought she could win it she could call it she knows she couldn't she knows it wouldn't go well for them and that's why she's not called it she's first minister she's got that majority they've got their 56, 55, 50, 54 they've got their 54 MPs down there do you know their uh, because of their uh, they could, they could call it they could fight for it, they're not, because they know, they know they would lose. And folks in Scotland have seen the bitterness and division that's still hankering, that's still hanging around in Scotland. There's a nasty aftertaste in many folks' mouths after yeah. this. It was, I hate people say, oh, what a pleasant, inclusive experience it was. Everyone got re-engaged. Folks were terrified, folks were abused, folks were still getting abused. Yeah. Well, I'll come yeah. on to that just in a second, but let me ask you, um, should the should the SNP yeah, should the SNP have another landslide vote in 2016? As a conservative, what do you take to that? I, if the election was today, if the election was today, they all have another landslide vote. Hey. 45, uh, 45% gets you a landslide vote. Yeah. Uh, when, the light, when the better together, the parties of the union are still larger than 55 is bigger than 45, but when 55 is split three or four ways, none of that adds up to 45. Uh, so that if the, election, yeah, if the election was today, I expect them to do well. I expect us, I expect the Conservatives to have the best ever. Uh, the best ever return of MSPs. Despite Labour and the, the Lib Dem misery to continue in Labour to have another experience of another miserable experience there. Uh, but yeah, I think I would be expecting them to do well because the 45 will the 45 will come out and go. For most of, yes. the 45 and for most of the 45 the dream will never die. The dream will never die. Give it ten years they'll be denying they had that dream and pretending they were. Well, see, look, see look, <coughs> let me state my position as I am. I'm I'm obviously a yes voter. I've not, never been an SNP voter and I would never really be a member of their party or anything, but I can see how the SNP has and it charmed a lot of left-wing people mm-hmm. with some of the stuff that they've said, a lot of rhetoric. Um, and I, and I, I, I attended a million debates where I've seen people who were uber left-wingers, if you like, say they were voting no because they, were, they didn't want to abandon people in Manchester yeah. and Liverpool, whatever. So I had people myself say to me in Manchester and Liverpool, don't abandon us. Mm-hmm. Yet, there doesn't seem to be a collective force that I'm sure you would agree that a lot of people vote yes because they, they hate the Tories. You said that, you know, and what you can and, yeah. and there's no doubt in my mind that what we witnessed in the week or two previous prior to the vote was politi- a political awakening like I've never seen in Scotland. Where not just the Tories but everybody was rushing up to Scotland and saying, hey, we could actually lose this. Yes. I don't think they expected that at that time. No uh, but it was it was quite, quite fun, quite challenging when that, when the poll came out that put you this ahead. Yeah. Folks, because we've been campaigning for years, it's been a long yeah, time yeah, yeah. run up to this, uh, and suddenly, suddenly, at sort of canvas sessions we go out, and we'd have, we've been going out for years where canvas sessions across the across the country, uh, near around near around Leith, yeah. uh, getting five or six at a canvas session and that's great you can get a lot of canvassing done with five or six folk especially if you're doing it over a, a couple of years <laughs> there was always five or always sort of five or six folks then a couple of weeks before you 
turn up a camping session, there's 80 folks standing there. Mm-hmm. I've got enough for five or six, no for eight. And then every every day, every day, you were out dealing with numbers in the hundreds. The folks had never knocked a door, never delivered a leaflet. They said they saw, they thought everything was going to be fine. They saw that pool. They were terrified. Out they came. The phone was melting, folks. Generally, Tories from down south, because I'm a Tory, and we know each other. What's going on here? I'm on the train, I'm coming up, I'm going to crash on your sofa, I'm going, the sofas are full, you can have the floor, I'll get, I'll borrow my neighbour's airbed, and you can, you know, the house became, my house became a doll's house, it was just full of folks all catching up, saying, what can we do? But it was folks from here, folks from everywhere, saying, how can we help? This can't happen. So yeah, there was, an, there was a shock, there was a fright, there was an awakening across the country, and uh, boy, everyone in the country, had had a good think about how they were going to vote and why they were going to vote. Turn out couldn't have been higher. Folks didn't they come out to yeah. vote in that after two and a half years of yeah, yeah, bombarding yeah. in the last couple of weeks of that? Yeah. I mean, nothing that, that, would, that poll in particular on that day I would liken very much to um, the Labour Party in 1992, a day or so before yep. the major was elected, where by all intents and purposes Labour were going to sweep in there. We had the victory rally at Sheffield, which was the biggest state we ever made. And of course, the Tories came out and, and still won the election. But I suppose the big question I have to ask you, and people will be screaming at this, I know, is why shouldn't Scotland, Scottish people govern themselves? We do. We do. We, we are not we, Well, we had a choice again. Uh, we had a choice again a year ago. What sort of government do we want? Do we want to pull and share our resources across the United Kingdom? Or do we want to do it on our own? Mm-hmm. We had that choice. Entirely, we chose the way we want to govern ourselves, which is pulling share resources across the United Kingdom. Massively democratic, a massively informed choice, the right one for me. There's no dog, there's no dog collar. Absolute choice. And we, you know, I think we made the right one. I think we dodged a bullet. I'm uh, happy that reflects public opinion there. Well, I mean, uh, again, we're going all day about that, but. I suppose, before we get on to the social media aspect here, the one thing I would say about democracy is, how, do, how does it tie in with democracy when the majority of people in Scotland vote for a party who all vote for a policy which is then voted down by Westminster in terms of Syria? How, does the, how do you then say to Scottish people that you're living in democracy? Well, the poll in uh, the couple of things. We choose very much to remain part of the United Kingdom. We chose very much to send our representatives and pool and share resources across the United Kingdom there. And the United Kingdom Parliament makes those decisions there. Uh, the SNP weren't voted for by a majority of the Scottish people. So, but in the representative democracy, in the representative democracy, they represent us all, but they're voted for a minority of Scottish folk. Uh, but they represent us all, and that's the system there. So I'm deeply disappointed Deirdre Brock doesn't want to take the fight uh, my local MP. Mm-hmm. Deeply disappointed. Yeah. Deeply disappointed she voted against taking the fight to IS. I want to take the fight to IS. I'd fight them on the moon, because they're coming for us. So uh, you're willing to go then? To sit up well, yourself? Well, no way I'm going to say that. I want, you just said you were going to take the fight. I, I want big bad trained killers mm. with great equipment to go there and keep us safe and that's what the forces do. Okay, big so big. you're willing to send people there but you're not actually willing to go yourself? How many last too long in Syria? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like most, a lot of people are going to last too long. It's a job for soldiers in Yemen and I'm no a soldier and I'm no an Yemen. Okay, let's, let's talk a bit of the SAP and go back to football maybe give them a bit of a kitchen again. No offensive behaviour at football, I'm sure you're on it. It's, I want to say it's the most foul bill they've come up with. One of the most foul bills they've come up with, because they've come up with, because they've come up with several. Uh, football fans get a hard deal in this country. We absolutely have, and again, maybe it's me and it's another group. You're a match going home and a wee heart supporter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Uh, another sort of grouping that I'm in that has no represent 
the Spitball fans, we've now represented ourselves well over the last mm-hmm. 20, 30 years, and we've been very passive and been very passive and articulating who we are, what we are, what we want, how we want to move on. It's been very handy and easy for folks that don't understand us all like us. So the high hygiene's yeah. in police Scotland, mm-hmm. the high hygiene's in this centralising authoritarian Scottish government. Mm-hmm. Uh, very easy for them to pick a fight with us, and we've no stuck up for ourselves saying, mm-hmm. no, we're absolutely good, decent, trustworthy, normal people yeah. who should be able to say what we want, sing what we want, have a good time at, have a good time at the football. The only sport you can't have a drink at I was watching the Davis Cup final the other day, Andy, Andy Murray in a Union Jack, all fantastic. <laughs> hey. The crowd, they were up, they were singing, they were standing, they were having a laugh and they were having a pint. <laughs> Uh, no, well, it's, yeah, all, it's, yeah. a, it's all right. It's all right. In Edinburgh, we see it with the rugby fans. Huh. Get that, hold it that courtesy. Only tennis thing is an aside. I must say, like I, I can't stand tennis, but it always seems everything Murray's on Twitter goes mental, and it was funny to see everybody go mental right up until that point you mentioned when he had the Union Jack and the national anthem came on, and it was just like, well, far, far, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, the fickle nature. But the, I 100% agree with you on the fact that. In terms of, I've never met a policeman in authority, or most of the SNP people I've heard speaking about the place with, who actually understand what football yeah. fans are like. Yeah, and, if, and there's a couple of things terif- a couple of things terrify me on it. One, uh, well, there's more than a couple. One of the big ones for me is there's young laddies in you, daft teenage laddies, yeah. getting stuck with a criminal record yep. for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. For stuff that most of us, you know, have done. Have done. Right. You sit there and go, if you're coming up and if you're coming up and through football, mm-hmm. a fourteen-year-old staff, yeah, a sixteen-year-old yeah. staff, <laughs> absolutely. In this, absolutely. Do you know, and this is, but part of the thing is, part of the thing is how you learn. And uh, part of the thing is how you learn is older guys at the football saying, then he be daft, and you, you know, you follow the folks. Because the vast majority are decent, and you do, you look out for your young ones and say, hey, put your neck in, that's not acceptable, mm. that's not right. And folks learn, and they do, they very much. But there's young ones in out, and this government's no saying, how are these ones going to learn, or these ones are learning, they're saying, criminal record, there you go, for life, you're good. That's going to follow you around, because he got drunk at 17 and said something yeah. the government didn't like you saying when you had a, you had a scoop at a football match, said something daft, and you got a criminal record for life, and today that's. It's terrifying, it's oppressive at the, the end. It's damaging folks' chances. Yeah, absolutely. Folks and will be sitting then, 20 years down the line having to explain. Is that a football match? It's like something daft. Or, or I did, not A policeman thought I did. And yeah, exactly. A policeman thought and I, I did. Exactly. And, done and I'll, take, I'll take you back to a hard celly game at the Dreamcast in May 2011, where obviously one head came to the park and yeah. actually Neil Lennon. And we all know what happened there and all that. But the next game, there was wootsy um, kind of uh, memos and statements going out with Celtic, urging fans to behave, urging fans going to this. And I've said at the time, and I have to be honest, that if that was me and I was 20 years old, I'd be taking two fingers up to Celtic saying, I'm going there to represent Celtic and scream and shout at all these guys. But as long as I'm not doing that in the street to you and then I'm meeting you in the pub and punch you in the face, what's the problem? Yeah. Keep it in the room that it's fine, you know. That Wilson, that Wilson case, uh, again, highlighted, uh, highlighted the stupid, narrow-minded, horrible legislation. Uh, public, pub, broadcast live across yeah. the country. There he is. He jumps at the stand. He runs up the terrace. Yeah. And he's no going to give Neil Lennon a cuddle. He takes, yeah, he yeah. takes a swing. Right. Mm-hmm. He gets arrested. He's on bail. Hey, he's not on bail. He's, he's arrested. He's on remand. Yeah. Uh, they're saying, right, you're going to plead guilty. To, uh, plead guilty to a sectarian assault. And he's going, no, I'm not sectarian. I put up my Catholic. No. <laughs> they're going, no, no, I was a sectarian. You called him a Fenian bastard. No, no, I didn't. I ran up and took a swing at him because I hate him. Yeah. Religions, religions know they are. Uh, so I plead guilty to assault because that's what it was. But it wasn't a sectarian assault. They pushed through and pushed through and pushed through to get a sectarian assault charge, which was no proven because it didn't happen. 
Yeah. Because it wasn't a sectarian assault. It was just an assault. So he didn't get the assault. He didn't get the assault charge because they were desperate for the sectarian crime to fit their bill to... Yeah. Whatever. And which... And they couldn't, and they couldn't stack it up because they didn't even see it. And then ultimately, a few people like me who were saying, we would have pointed this justice system and say, look, I told you. I told you. You know? And it's... Uh, yeah, I mean, it is incredible. And in terms of hearts, obviously, you've been to the mill and back. In the last couple of years, probably... One of the things I think with Hearts, it's been noticeable, and I'm sure you've heard this, is that Hearts are getting more and more um, abuse for fans that go to the Ibrox. And that looks to me as like, I mean, I'll give you an example. The one when you broke the strip with all the names of people who have club, suddenly the two complaints at that. And it, it seems to me that because Hearts are kind of shown as an example of this is how you actually come back yeah. to the depths. That's media, but a prior with, with, with that, with that, these, these 80 fans. But in terms of, obviously, you were at the EGM yesterday, um, the club's kind of owned up, they're going to build a new stand, etc. The, the, the fans there are a shining light in what can be achieved, yet could be criminalised on Saturday at the game. Yeah. What's it been like to be a heart supporter the last couple of years? It's, good. it's been great. It's been great fun. It's been a great ride as a heart. And it has it has been a great a great ride. Even even getting real even getting relegated once uh, once a penny dropped up and we're going down. Mm-hmm. A bit of certainty is quite fun when you know hey, we're going down. Folks saying hey we're shy and we know we are and and they have fun with it because when you're shy and you know you are you can. Mm-hmm. That's quite a fun. That's quite a fun thing in itself. Uh, that season we came down. The latter bit of that season was great fun, especially, especially as we sat there. Hibs came for a relegation yeah. party. At, mm-hmm. You know, they came for a relegation party at our patch and uh, got relegated themselves. And we're sitting watching them imploding coming next to us. Because that's one of the things about being a football fan that folks don't always. That folks who are not football fans don't don't particularly get. Of course they were going to come and have a relegation party. We were going down and they were going yeah, to laugh at us and try and annoy us. And of course, when they went down, we're going to laugh right back. And it's mm-hmm. great banter, it's great fun, and it made what should have been a crap season for us. Suddenly. Suddenly, uh, there's, a wee bit of, there's a wee bit of sunlight. No, there. I know, I know. Yeah. And it's, I think people who say they didn't really understand that, 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 that kind of... At that point, I think it was about seven games to go or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so I think I saw Hibs needed one victory to yeah, stay up and never yeah, got it. And never got it. When doing the obstacle playoff. Davey Farrell, who used to play for Hibs yeah, yeah. on this podcast, said that when he played for Hibs, he played, he played in the 22 in a row thing. Never won a game against Hibs. And I asked him about that and he said it was because Hearts went to war in the games and we never won. Do you, do you, I've, not, I've been at, I was at the Hibs Hearts semi-final in 2006 when Hearts won 4 no Hearts was all brilliant. You could have put your bets the phone five minutes before that game. Oh, I did. You got to win. <laughs> I mean, it was just me contest. Yeah. What and is that? What is the thing? Some of it's a. Uh, some of it's that warrior. Some of it's that warrior thing. Uh, our, our guys, our guys do. Some of again. Uh, there's a historical. There's been a rotten hibs. There's been a rotten hibs, and mm-hmm. part of that has come from us consistently hammering them. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, it, 22 in a row was great there was one game in between an 18 in a row one game yes, and a 22 right. in a row I, 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 my glowing academic career at secondary school I didn't once go into school after a derby and Hibs had beat us there wasn't one time throughout my, second, through my secondary school I didn't once go in and have the heavies in my class say, ha ha, we pumped you at the weekend. Because mm. they never did it. No one's, every single derby, we went and going, 15, 16, yeah. come on, 17 in a row, come on guys, give us a game one of these times. It was you know, fantastic for uh, fantastic for me as a... 
Well, that, I mean, it, it, becomes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it becomes a psychological it, thing. There's a psychological because, flaw in Hibs there. I mean, David Farrell talked about the, the obvious, the worst defeat for Hibs in that game was the Cup game when Foster yeah. scored the last minute. Yeah. He played in the game, he says, we're all over them. It's one all, mm-hmm. it's, this is it, we've got to do it. As soon as that ball went forward for Mackay, he's a new score. Yeah. You just feel it in the air, yeah, you know. Yeah. And it's and bit, football fans, we can sense it, can't we? And it's the same, that, that season we got relegated, we had Hibs in the League Cup at Easter Road. They battered us for half an hour. Battered us. Jamie McDonald was just outstanding in the goals, and he he saves his good performances for Hibs. Outstanding in the goals, chance after chance after chance, save after save after save. Punted the ball up. Stevenson turns and smashes one in through outside the box. One 0 half an hour in. We yeah. touched the ball. We're one 0 up. I was fans start leaving because they know they're beat. We have touched the ball. We're one 0 up. The Hibs fans they know they're beat. We know we've won. We know they'll play for another hour, but they're so soft, so soft, so yeah. weak. We know the game's over half an hour in. Game was over half an hour in. Yeah, and, Hib- and Hibs were the better team. Yeah, Hibs were by far the better team. Um, so, right, before we round up on yeah. something, I want to go back to the social media thing yeah. um, in terms of how has that changed politics? You've talked about divisions, and I've noticed the divisions, you know. I can put my hands up and say, ten years ago, I'd have been screaming, shouting, ranting, and raving like the rest of them. You grow up a wee bit mature. I don't think it helps at all. On both sides, there are guys and, and organisations and that and Twitter streams are horrific. Yeah. They're putting many arguments forward. I mean, has that led to you getting a lot of abuse? Yeah, you get it. Yeah, you get abuse, and you just have to. Uh... I think there's a. Okay, and I don't mind it. I don't mind it when it's funny, but you gotta understand. Uh, you gotta understand the. You gotta understand the medium, uh, and it is. You gotta understand the medium there. Uh, you gotta understand that there are idiots. I done the TV the other night, and uh, wings over Scotland. Reverend Stuart Campbell lives in Bath as rats. Uh, he tweeted Desi and McGill drunk on the telly again. And, all his wee acolytes is there sitting going, oh, then he must be pissed. Oh, do you hear the way he talks? T- Tories, then he talk like that. That's it's fine. Wings will do. Wings will do what Wings does, and that's fine. Chris Graham will do what Chris Graham does, and his wee acolytes will sit and send you tweets saying you're a disgrace and you're a shambles and all of that. And that's that's fine. I'm happy to keep. I guess for me, there's an element of a. Uh, I don't particularly engage with them. I'll, Sometimes provoke them a little bit by saying, How can I get to number one on Chris Graham's list? <laughs> they all go, You dirty man, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but you, I don't particularly engage with them. There's no. Yeah. Twitter's, Does it ever Twitter's, extend to Twitter's great. Twitter. Uh, yeah, you get, you get stuff. Uh, I was having a look at a. Uh, I had a look after the referendum for an article. Than I knew. So we had journalists out all the time. The world's press were here, mm-hmm. and they were coming out, seeing what both sides were doing. So especially the last couple of weeks, I wasn't out in a session that didn't have. Hey, I'm a journalist from Brazil. Hey, I'm a yeah, yeah. Japanese TV company. Hey, I'm a Swedish press journalist here and a South African radio journalist. There was always someone coming out to report back. So I was out, Grace Uruguay, just no far from the Hip Stadium, Sunday afternoon, and had two. Uh, I'm okay, a plug for Word of Mouth Cafe on Albert Street, best cafe in town. Yeah. Uh, out Hamage, Hamage Park, uh, so just you know, far for the Hib Stadium, Sunday afternoon, doing a canvas session, uh, probably about a dozen of us on it. Mm-hmm. Probably about a dozen of us doing these few streets. Out with two Swedish journalists, so press journal, uh, written media, uh, I'm going to, going to say girls, but they're not. Uh, they're typical Swedes. You would know they were Swedes. Right, two, okay. ve- two very blonde, mm-hmm. uh, two very blonde folks. And what we were doing, we were looking. Uh, we'd said if we met anyone interesting on the doorsteps, we'd introduce up to the Swedish journalists. Sure. So there was one of them had gone in. There was a woman had said. There was a woman on the street had said she would love to have a no poster up, but she was too scared because she thought the windows would get put mm-hmm. in. So we said to the Swedish journalist, yeah, you might want to have a have a chat with this woman and ask her why she wouldn't want to put a 
I better to get a poster up in her window. So the journalist's there. So I went back to get the jo- I went back along to get the journalist after a few minutes because canvas teams moved along. She comes away going, "Oh great! There's an old man walking his dog. An old man walking his dog on a Sunday afternoon." Went off on a rant at me and this uh, me and this journalist uh, went off on a big rant. Westminster paedophiles, all of that, uh, properly shouting and bawling about paedophiles in the street. <laughs> and off he goes, carries on his Sunday afternoon walking his dog. Does he think I'm a paedophile? <laughs> no, he doesn't think you're a paedophile. She's good. Why would an old man on a Sunday afternoon come up and scream in my face about paedophiles? <laughs> Welcome to it. That's well, a I'm going. That's just embarrassing trying to. Exp- Embarrassing mm. trying to explain that. Uh, you know, this is this big, friendly, inclusive, cosy thing. You know, men are up in the street bawling at Swedish journalists about paedophiles because so some folks are better together, badges. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that so, is, is, and, and that's a, that's that more, does lend into the division that's yeah, keen. Yeah, and is that's it, more embarrassing. Than, that's more embarrassing than a few idiots on Twitter tweeting yeah. something. Tweeting their tweeting the mantras out. Twitter's great, but you just have to ignore. You know, you ignore them. You go great. They're no, they're no for influence and for talking or for interacting really. But there's a ton of great folks. There's a ton of great folks mm-hmm. on Twitter. So we're saying here, this is a great person. We can have some banter there, and we can swap ideas, and yeah. we can even be friends and have a cup of tea sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, well, suppose that lines in the final question, which is, you're a heart supporter in Leith. Yeah. You're a Tory in Leith. Do you like being hate? Is this a thing? No one hates me. No one hates me. <laughs> hey. Do you like being an No, there might be something contrary to me. Mm. Uh, there might be, but a Hearts fan and Leafs no unusual. Aye. And it's not. A Hearts fan and Leafs no unusual. A couple of my brothers are heavies, but we were left to our own devices as, a, as kids. We were left to our own devices, so I fell in with a good crowd at school. A couple of my brothers fell in with bad crowds at school, so they end up at Easter Road and I end up at Tyne Castle. Because we're going to fit our pals. That's just offy, offy Scottish. That's no contrary. That's no. And you went. You just went in a long second. Aye, aye, yeah. So is that a reason you're not in the cabinet now? Because you're not. You didn't go to eat in or. Oh, I did not think going to eat and would have helped me get elected and leave. <laughs> 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 I like doing. I like doing my. I like doing. I like doing my local. I like doing my local patch. So. It and this is this is this is my patch. This is my local patch. But I've been a Hearts fan in Leith, isn't it, Contrary? I've been a Tory in Leith, isn't it, Contrary? Either. Fair enough. Well, that's that's all for that, folks. Some interesting stuff there. Something new for the podcast. Uh, the background noise, as Ian said, was provided by World Day Mouth and Albert Street in Leith. This has been a Homeboy's Extra for the Hill Media, and we shall see you again soon.